Well, that was a wild and crazy week. The last time I got together with Mr. Stephen Van Meter, we actually recorded the video. It was Friday, March 10th. The news about Silicon Valley Bank had just broken. In fact, we had just heard that it had been taken into receivership. We were then looking back at what the market or looking at what the markets were doing at the time and thinking, wow, this was something. That was Friday. And that seems like a long, long time ago. Over the week since then, and today is Friday, March 17th, so one week further on, Silicon Valley Bank, to me, seems like a very distant memory. Not because uh, it wasn't a big deal, because it was a big deal, but it has been overshadowed by everything that happened this week, which seems to be incredibly important because in between last Friday and this Friday, We've had a lot of stuff happen, including the government come in, the FDIC, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve invented a new four-letter program, which they'll tell you is the answer to all of our prayers. But then the data we got just yesterday suggests, well, maybe not. So incredible things have happened. Silicon Valley Bank really isn't the center of it, nor is it really what we're interested in. And oh, by the way, I think I want to get Stephen Van Meter's take on this. Markets told you all along that this was likely to happen. Now, not exactly, not, hey, Silicon Valley Bank is the one that's going to fail, but the potential for something bad in the monetary system to come up was exceptionally high and getting higher all the time. And now that that warning has been really validated in, in a way that everybody can see, I think we need to ask Steve, we, need to, we think we need to talk about what are markets telling us today? What are they warning us about today now that all that other stuff has happened and now that we're looking forward afterwards into the aftermath? So, Steve, wow, what a week, right? And now markets were, hey, they said this was coming and now they're, what are they saying now? Yeah, great question, Jeff, because the first thing we always get is, wow, nobody saw this coming, right? The news, wow, out of nowhere, banks are failing, things are going wrong, Fed's throwing money around. And I think the important thing where we need to start, and, and I don't want to harp too much on Silicon Valley Bank, but I do want to suggest that it wasn't a localized issue. It wasn't that, you know, this bank had lent to a whole bunch of tech startups that had gone bankrupt, and it was just, you know, too much risk concentrated in a bank, because if that was the case, then the story wouldn't be even a story. It would just be like, yeah, well, stupid bank takes too much risk and fails, so what? Notably, it started to spread, and now this contagion seems to be all over the place where we're seeing policymakers all the way from the Fed, the Treasury, and anyone else, even the bank CEO, big bank CEOs, are literally throwing solutions at the wall, and we're all standing there going like, well, that one didn't work, that one didn't work. And so, the, you, as you said, Jeff, was there any sort of indicator that something potentially could be wrong in the financial system or the plumbing? And it, lo and behold, happens to be there's a, some strange thing that I think we've talked about a time or two called the inverted yield curve. And I know you're going to tell us just how bad and how many of these curves are inverted, because I'm going to go on a limb and say all of them. <laughs> all of them. Yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, it, you're right. It's it's suddenly everything seemed to be fine, or at least everybody was told everything was fine. And then all hell breaks loose. And what we hear from authorities is, well, everything is still fine. We've got this covered. We've got all of these things. We've got the BTFP. As you said, the big banks have gotten together and cobbled this, this rescue plan, which sounds a little bit too much like LTCM or Lehman Brothers or any of the other rescue plans that have been cobbled together throughout the years. And I think most people are, are saying, well, what does that have to do with Silicon Valley Bank? And as you're saying, Steve, and I agree with you 100 percent, it's not about Silicon Valley Bank because you're right. If it was just a bunch of dumb bankers in California who did stupid things, everybody would say, good, good riddance. We don't need you. This is this is a systemic thing. And I want people to understand, too, that it's not just about U.S. regional banks. This is not just about the United States. One thing I want to ask you about, too, when we get to it, Steve, is China just cut the RRR rate this morning, which is an acknowledgement that they're a little bit worried about all of this monetary business way over there in California because it's systemic. There's, there's more going on here. Uh, and as you said, the curves had said 
They warned you all last year that the probability of deflationary money was getting higher and higher. The more the curves inverted, whether it was euro dollar futures, whether it was U.S. treasuries, German bonds, Canadian bonds, all of them all over the world. Because, again, this is a global thing. They kept saying the probability of something like this happening was going up and up and up. And now that it's happening, as I said in the open, it happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and First Republic is now being talked about in buyout and all this other stuff. The markets are saying that wasn't the end of it. That was sort of the beginning. That was the confirmation that everything that we had been worried about is actually something to be worried about. And looking at where the curves are now, what they're saying is there is much more to be worried about, not in the months ahead, but maybe even the weeks ahead. Jeff, that that is exactly what I'm concerned about, because if, if you said, hey, you know, blindfold Steve and say, here's the setup, right? You know, people are running to the Fed discount window out of, you know, the, the biggest rate in history. There's collateral shortages. All the curves are steeply inverted. You know, the, there just seems to be banks failing, panic happening, weird bailouts going on. And you said, guess where we are in, in the cycle, in, in the economic cycle? I'd say, oh, gosh, Jeff, we're at the depths of a recession. We're in the middle of a huge financial crisis. And if you said, Steve, what if I told you that unemployment claims were just still right around 200,000? The non-farm payrolls were running a couple hundred thousand a month. And all these, all this data that says everything's fine, I said, well, no, that's not possible. And that's what concerns me, Jeff, is if this is happening now and we're seeing deflationary money now, we're seeing collateral shortages now, what happens when something actually goes wrong, such as, hey, wait a minute, people stop start losing their jobs and then they stop making payments on their loans. If these, If we think this is bad for the banks now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because the economy is allegedly and has every appearance of being in decent shape. So, yeah, we've got a problem here. And China is far smart enough to figure it out because they're on the other side of the demand equation. If demand in the U.S. is going down, they are going to see it because their factories are going to not have the new order growth that they need to see. And, yeah, they've got every reason to cut because they came out of their, you know, uh, lockdown. And what happened to their economy? It's kind of just tripped over itself. So yeah, I, I'm. What's surprising is the ECB raised rates, and I'm going to go out on a limb for next Friday's show or whenever we record that the Fed's probably going to raise rates on Wednesday. Yeah, I think that's really the biggest point here is that the economic consequences are backloaded, that we haven't seen them yet. We've seen the economy look soft. We've seen the economy look weak. The hard data is well, it's concerning, but it's not alarming. Uh, just today, we got you uh, industrial production in the U.S., which was flat, certainly not something to be completely upset about. It was negative year over year, which is usually a recession signal, but not it's not, you know, set your hair on fire and hedge like it's the end of the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why we saw such epic, huge moves in markets after Silicon Valley Bank at, during the week is because the market said, this is deflationary money today that is going to have even bigger consequences tomorrow, the next day, and the next day after that. And then it's just been one after another after another. And you're right. The Chinese are looking at this and saying, unlike the Europeans who said, hey, everything's great. The economy, we've upgraded our economic outlook. <laughs> I mean, it's just that ridiculous. The Europeans are doing one thing. The Chinese, much more pragmatic, apparently saying, uh-oh, this is probably going to be trouble in China too. So as you're saying, Steve, I think that's one of the biggest uh, biggest reasons, the primary reasons that we saw such epic hedging this week, well beyond anything we saw in 2008, is because the consequences aren't limited to right now. It's not just one regional bank or two regional banks. There's going to be financial fallout and there's going to be economic fallout and it's going to be pretty darn severe. Right. And, and the funny thing is, Jeff, and you've seen this, we're seeing policymakers around the world. We'll just exclude China because maybe they're, maybe, and I'm not suggesting that their cutting rates fixes anything, but at least it seems to be an acknowledgement that, hey, we don't know what's going on in the rest of the world, but if, if we've been going up, let's try going down. Maybe that will help. I mean, and that's generally what central bankers do. If, if one thing doesn't work, you just do the opposite and somehow magically things fix themselves. But what we're hearing from all these people and all these experts is 
The issue is with inflation. There is no systemic banking crisis. Now, I get it. If Again, if it was just Silicon Valley Bank, we could just say, hey, you know what? Let's just set that aside and say, again, dumb bankers making dumb things. But it wasn't. It's just more than one bank. In fact, there's, you know, we saw um, out of Europe, we saw Credit Suisse having problems, needing a bailout. Um, so you start to look around and say, how is this not a systemic crisis? And again, policymakers don't get it. Because if I'll, I'm going to throw this on the table, Jeff, for, for you. It, is there anything that you can think of that could be maybe more deflationary than a banking crisis? Because, you know, when consumers get afraid of their money, I, I don't think they go out and spend it. I don't think like, hey, you know what? I'm worried about that money in the bank. I think I'll go buy a new car or go out to eat. No, I think they sit at home, panic and worry about their money and start moving things around and stop spending. And I think in the past, we've seen that when there's a banking crisis, boy, it, it is very deflationary. Yeah, there's two things right there. Uh, number one, as you said, consumer spending. Just today, the University of Michigan released its consumer survey that fell, not sharply, but it fell back toward the lows, which I'm not sure exactly when the survey was conducted, but I got to imagine the survey wasn't conducted entirely this week. So maybe the real consumer sentiment is already starting to plummet. When consumer sentiment had been improving for several months as consumer price pressures had declined. So again, something to look forward to in a negative way. But you're right. Inflation isn't a problem during a banking crisis. And we know that it's a banking crisis. We knew, again, we knew it was going to be something like this because markets had told us ahead of time. And what we've gotten over the last week is just more confirmation that this is truly a serious deflationary monetary outbreak. And we even got a data point yesterday from the Federal Reserve itself that basically, I don't want to say it proves it, but it's more solid evidence that the entire system has experienced a deflationary spasm. I'm talking about, of course, primary credit or what used to be called the discount window. The discount window that in its modern incarnation was the emergency funding window. The If, if you still think of the Federal Reserve as lender of last resort, which you shouldn't, but if you do, this was the lender of last resort tactic. And what they reported for this week as of Wednesday level was 85 billion. Now, what is 85 billion? 85 billion is far and above anything we saw in 2020. 85 billion is like we saw in the marketplace, late September 2008 and early October 2008 territory, which tells you this wasn't just a couple dumb bankers in California who got their bank into trouble. Suddenly, a lot of small banks found that they were shut down from wholesale markets and had no other option but to go pleading to the Federal Reserve for some limited funding. That's a systemic issue. This is beyond Silicon Valley Bank. And Steve, I, we've talked about this a little bit uh, more off the air than on the air, but in terms of a systemic issue, just thinking about it big picture, forget Silicon Valley for a minute. We know that regional banks, smaller banks have been bled dry from cash. Their cash cushions have gone down. And that cash is migrated up into the larger banks. So the question isn't about the smaller banks as much as why aren't the larger banks redistributing the cash back to the smaller banks, which is what left Silicon Valley Bank exposed. That's where I think we need to be talking. Don't you think that's the same thing, Steve? Yeah, and because there's two levels here, right? There's a collateral side, which is what you're referring to, is why is the system not working the way it should? We have these mechanisms. You know, the fact that you're seeing all the, you know, I want everyone to understand the fact that you're seeing all these people, all these banks go to the Fed, this is not normal because there's, there's a huge negative stigma, right? This is like going, you know, being 50 years old and going to your dad and asking for money, right? It, it just doesn't play well, right? You just don't do it. So when you see all these banks go to the Fed, what it's telling depositors is, hey, I don't know what's going on over here at my bank, but something must be really bad if they're going over there, which is only, in my opinion, Jeff, going to make this worse because people are going to panic more. But yet you see this huge draw on the credit line. You're seeing the mechanisms, the collateral systems that are supposed to grease the wheels. And, and why shouldn't we see this? The big banks have boatloads of money. I mean, they've got so much money, they brag and say, we don't want all this money. Well, great. They need it. You got it. Why don't you force it back down to them through the systems in play? That And, and it's not working. That's a big question. What is causing this whole freaking system to seize up? 
Yeah, and it's a multifaceted question. It's always multifaceted. It's never one thing or another. As we always talk about, there's there's the money dealers who are becoming risk averse for several reasons. And as they become risk averse, what do they do? They take their money off the table and just hoard it. So, you know, again, the lesson of Bear Stearns, they raise their own cash cushions, they de-risk, they hedge the hell of their portfolios. And the last thing they want to do is extend short-term funding loans to small regional banks who might be experiencing depositor difficulties because the small banks don't have the collateral that they can post or transform in order to make that wholesale emergency rescue work. And I think that's another point I want to emphasize here, too, is that normally in a situation like this, um, somebody like Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank, what they would do is they would go into their illiquid loan book and say, I'm going to take $100 million in illiquid loans out of, out of my book. I'm going to liquefy that by pledging those $100 million in illiquid loans to a money dealer like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. I'm going to borrow U.S. Treasuries, not the same amount. There's probably going to be a substantial haircut, but they're going to give me U.S. Treasuries. They're going to lend me U.S. Treasuries so that I can then go into the repo market in order to secure at least some short-term financing that keeps the doors open, that keeps me from having to fire sale assets. That didn't happen. It obviously didn't happen in enough banks that they had to go running to the Federal Reserve this week. So again, and that ties in with what we saw in four-week Treasury bills on Wednesday in particular, that 60-some basis point drop in the four-week T-bill rate, which was, I don't even have words for that one. So it all wraps up into this, these, the, our systemic issues. They're the same systemic issues that we've been talking about. They're the same systemic issues that have inverted curves all along. And getting back to our original question here, it seems like the markets are even more worried today than they were worried last week about these systemic issues. Right, exactly. So let's put this in a way that maybe you know we, we can net this down to a way that people can understand. Let's say I have a house that's paid off. Well, and we'll say it's illiquid because they don't transact and I need money and I can't just sell it in three seconds, right? I can't go do that. So I go to the bank and I say, Hey bank, I want to lend against this. And they say, sure, but we're not gonna lend hundred percent. Fine, no problem. I'll pledge my house as, as collateral. Great. And they give me in this case we're going to say treasury securities, or we'll just say tokens of some kind. It doesn't really matter. Just something that isn't the actual money I need. But there happens to be a dealer out there exchanging, you know, think of it, you're at the airport, you're at currency exchange, right? So I take my tokens to the currency exchanger and I say, hey, look, I got a whole bunch of these tokens and I'd like to exchange them for uh, cash. And they say, hey, no problem. So here's the problem, right, Jeff, is the banks aren't lending against my house and the money changers aren't changing money. The question is, what is it that the, that the big banks know about my house that I don't know? And then secondly, what is it about those tokens I get from the big bank that the money changers don't want to change? You've got two problems here and it's telling you something really serious is wrong. Unfortunately, we don't know what it is. We'd love to know what it is and we won't find out till later. But the fact that you have those two instances going on, it'd be different if the bank said, look, we'll lend against your house and it's not our fault. You can't get, the, get our tokens changed out or, hey, we're not going to lend against your house, but if you have the tokens, we'll change your money out. We have two problems. Don't know why, but nobody wants to lend to anybody for any reason right now. Yeah. And the thing is, the problem isn't you. And that's really the point that it's, it's the, why aren't these two systemic processes taking place? Like they should, like you should, like they should happen. And it really, I mean, it goes back to something you said, I think in last week's show or the week before, the week before where you say, I think it had to have been last week. You don't see banks like this fail. You don't see these systemic issues rise when everything really is fine. And we should expect that central bankers and politicians are going to tell us repeatedly in the weeks and months ahead, everything is fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to cover everything. Uh, we're going to get everything going. We're going we're gonna to do what it takes. The old Mario Draghi quote. We're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that everything happens. And yet when you see... 2008 levels of swings in the market, 2008 levels of use of the discount window, a beyond 2008 level of collateral run on a nondescript Wednesday. Well, it wasn't nondescript Wednesday. It was March 15th, which is something we always talk about. But either way, when you see these types of things, it's first of all, it's not fine. But second of all, and this is the most important point, back to Steve's point, it's going to have a continuous, continuing cumulative effect 
over the weeks and months ahead that we have not seen the ultimate consequences of this yet. And that more than anything, just in very basic, broad terms, explains what we're seeing in the marketplace. Steve, one last thought here. You know, Jeff, I think you almost took the words out of my mouth because that's, I, I think that's the issue here is we come up to the Fed meeting, right? What we're going to hear for Powell, we fixed everything. We've got this new thing. And the question that you and I would ask is, well, why didn't you anticipate this? Why didn't you have this program? And why is everyone staying at your discount window instead of over here? And how is it you have no clue what's going on? Well, the answer is they don't. But we know on Wednesday, Powell's going to say, hey, everything's okay. We got this solved. And inevitably, they're not going to have anything solved. Yeah, the market's just not buying. One last thought for me. Uh, right now, Euro dollar futures, the curve is entirely verted from the front down into the blues, which means the market is expecting another rate hike. They are expecting another rate hike, but that will be not just the final hike, is very likely to be the next meeting after that. We start seeing rate cuts. And once the rate cuts happen, what's being priced into the marketplace right now, as I speak on March 17th, is a rapid series of rate cuts in relatively short order. That doesn't sound fine at all to me either, Steve. Nope, sure doesn't, but we'll be here to cover it. Okay, yeah, well, look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care.